Hello everyone, I'm Kate and uh, I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, Waterbird ID. Uh, so this is part of the online series of the 2021 Birding 101 series, so season one. Um, and yeah, we're just going to do a recap of the content from the Waterbird session of that series. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name's Kate. I'm one of the youth reps based in Dorset. I'm 22 and my pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm also a training officer with the BTO as well. I'm just starting um, new in 2023. Um, and yeah, today I'll be leading you for the session. So this is gonna be an online session, clearly, um, and it will be interactive, um, but where we'd normally do polls or ask questions, I'll ask a question and as it's on YouTube, uh, if you just want to pause it and have a think um, and then if you play it I'll continue to give the answers. Um, yeah, enjoy. So today's topics, uh, we're going to talk about what are water birds, why watch water birds, we're then going to do a bit of an introduction into waterfowl ID focusing on ducks, uh, talk about uh, the UK as a winter wonderland, why is it so good for water birds in winter, uh, monitoring the wetland birds uh, Monitoring birds in the wetland bird survey, uh, so webs, and the challenges. So firstly, what are water birds? Um, so simply, water birds are birds that you'll find near water. Um, a lot of birds use water, so it, we do need to narrow it down a little bit more than that. Um, so firstly, and I guess most familiarly, um, waterfowl. Uh, so we've got our ducks, geese and swans. Um, under ducks you also have sawbills, so these are, um, their, their bills are a bit different, they're like fish eating ducks. You've got grebes, divers, uh, and that's pretty much it for the kind of round floaty things. And then we've also got things that don't hang out on the water so much, so tall leggy things, so waders, herons, cranes, rails, crakes and coots cormorants and then I think probably most people's favourite water bird the kingfisher I haven't labelled that because I feel like it's quite self-explanatory they're just so iconic um, so why watch water birds well I think water birds they, they're quite nice to start with because it's quite easy birding um, so quite often you go to an area and um, it's not like watching birds in trees they're often quite uh, kind of quite exposed you can see them quite easily uh, a lot of the times, they because they feel safe on the water, they'll come to you as well, or not necessarily come to you, but um, they're not quite as scared as other birds, so um, they tend to be a bit more tame. Um, also, sometimes you can find some goodies in, in these if you scan the flock. So, for example, a classic in the winter, and I know at the minute there's a few around the country, if you're scanning a flock of teal, which we'll cover a bit later, um, and if you see a male that has this kind of um this like vertical line this white line down it's down its front then you're almost like you're a green wing teal uh, so little things like that it's, it's quite good fun it's a bit like bird aware's wally water birds are also they just look absolutely stunning and they've also got really cool stories to tell so i mean a classic is the mandarin duck it's an introduced species here in the uk but they are just they're just so, so stunning, aren't they? Um, even more common birds like the mallard, I think we kind of take them for granted. But if you look at that bottle green head, just the iridescence, so the way it kind of reflects the light is stunning. Um, and then birds like the potcher, the diving duck, uh, if you get a really smart male and that red head, and if you look, that eye sometimes is just so, so red. It's amazing. Um, so yeah, they look awesome, but also they have stories to tell. So for example, the potcher, uh, so from the ringing scheme, so this is where a, a scheme that the BTO runs, um, as well as a kind of, it's an international project, a lot of other countries do it as well, where you put a metal ring on a bird's leg that has a unique code. Um, and a recovery from that uh, has told us that a potchard was ringed over 5,000 kilometres away from where it was then found. So it was, it was ringed in its breeding grounds and it was found in the UK over 5,000 kilometers away. Um, and that was about five months difference, but it probably did that journey a lot quicker than that. Um, and also from ringing, uh, the ringing scheme, we know that potchards have been recorded living up to 22 years. That's as old as me. Um, and they are about this big. <laughs> it's, it's quite impressive. 
Uh, and finally, wetlands are very special. So over 40% or around 40% of animals and plants rely on wetlands in the UK. Uh, they're just, they're so important. They have so many resources. Uh, because of all the resources, you get a massive wealth of diversity. So for example, you get really, really nice insects, loads of damselflies, dragonflies, um, even like the like the mosquitoes and things like that, that a lot of other birds, even like swallows, house martins, you see them feeding over water because all these insects are coming up off it. Um, you get the fish inside, which then fish in the water, which means that, that birds can come and eat the fish. Um, and then otters come and eat the fish. It's just an absolutely amazing ecosystem. Um, yeah, we definitely need to look after our wetlands. They're also really important for things like tackling climate change. Um, and even just for our mental health as well. If you go and sit by your local garden pond or go to your local wetland, then it's just such a, such a nice experience. It will make you feel better. So now we're gonna focus on uh, waterfowl ID. So if we focus on those groups, the first group that we looked at when we talked about what are water birds, um, this family is uh, the first three. Oh, with my thing, what's the word? There we go. So the family is Anatidae, uh, and that is ducks, geese, and swans. Um, so it's quite self-explanatory, but ducks tend to be quite small, a bit shorter bills, quite short legs. Geese, a bit bigger, quite long necks, um, bit longer legs. And then you've got the swans, white, long necks. Yeah, it's quite, it's quite simple. Um, so today, for uh, the purpose of this, we're going to focus uh, mainly on duck ID, but a lot of the features that we're going to talk about um, in terms of like the shape, you can also use on these other groups, but also any birds, if you, it just kind of opens your eyes as to what to look for. So, ducks. Uh, there's two main groups of ducks. So the first group is uh, dabblers. So these are mainly mallard pintail, shoveler, widgeon, gadwall, and teal. So these are our kind of most common dabblers in the UK and dabblers essentially don't dive to feed really. So um, they tend to uh, kind of go along either feed on the surface of the water um, or they'll, you'll see them upending where they, they kind of stick their bum in the air and put the head down and they're feeding um, with the head in the water. Um, or other species such as widgeon, they also like to graze as well. So um, yeah, they're kind of just see them on top of the water. The other group is divers. So Ida, golden eye, and then these three, tufted duck, pochard, and scorp are athia ducks. So they're kind of, they all look quite similar, the bottom three, they're in the same group. Um, and these ducks, as the name suggests, dive for food. Um, so you'll see them, it makes them quite fun to count. Um, I find it fun watching them dive and then waiting to see where they're gonna pop up, it's quite a good game. But yeah, you see them dive for food and that's their main feature of this group. So if you see a duck, how do you go about identifying it? So male ducks in the breeding season, or not breeding season, in their breeding plumage, so this spans from um, kind of winter through to the spring, um, they should be fairly straightforward with good views and a good ID guide. So as you can see from these four, uh, they tend to be quite different, quite striking. The features are quite obvious. Um, so for example, the golden eye and the mallard both have green heads, but you can see the golden eye has got this like white patch. Mallard has a big yellow bill. Uh, pintail, the tail is quite a giveaway. <laughs> that chocolate brown head and a gadwall is just, they're subtly beautiful. Um, so yeah, male ducks are quite different. Um, however, female ducks tend to be quite brown, quite similar. Um, so the key to identifying them is to know the structure of the males really well. So when we talk about structure, in this case, the features to focus on are size and shape. Beak, head, neck and tail, the compactness. So are they kind of quite small and quite dumpy or are they quite kind of, I don't know, a, a bit stick out of them? <laughs> They've got a long neck. Um, and also the elegance. So things like, are they quite dumpy? Do they look quite smooth? Um, sounds weird. When you see a duck, you'll, you'll yeah, 
it will make sense. Um, so yeah, these are the main features that we focus on. So now if we ignore the colours, so if we just look at the silhouettes and these are the birds that we were looking at just now, the four males, what are the structural features of these birds? So I put them down at the bottom corner um, and if you want to pause it, just to have a look at them and think about how they're different. Uh, so yeah, pause it, have a think. Okay, so hopefully you've had a think about those and you've been kind of identifying the differences. Uh, so let's start with um, the top left, the, which was the golden eye. It's got quite a short stubby bill uh, compared to all of the others. Um, it's also its head is quite it's almost a bit pointed the shape of it whereas the others tend to be quite round and probably the most compact as well um, in contrast if we probably the most different is the bottom right the pintail so he's got that really it's quite elegant the shape it's all quite smooth and then it comes to this beautiful point in the tail um, the mallard the bottom left has this little little curly tail but like a little pig um and the gadwall top right has got quite a rounded head. So as you can just, as you can see, they are quite different uh, when you just think about the structure. So here you go, here they are in color again. Um, okay, now we have another activity. So this activity is called matchmakers. So what I'd like you to do is match the males and the females um, so we haven't seen any females yet. So this is a test to see if you can work it out from the structure. So again, I've got the points up there um, and they're all numbered and lettered. Um, and yeah, if you want to have a go at matching them up together, see how you get on. OK, hopefully you've done that. Um, so shall we go to the answers? Here we go. So one matches with B and that's a tufted duck. Two matches with A and that's a, an Ida. Three matches with C and that's a shoveler. So you can kind of guess why they named that after the bill. And then four is with D and that is a pintail. So it's worth noting that the female pintail doesn't have as long a point on its tail. It is still quite pointed um, on its tail, but it hasn't got that, that long extension um, because that's kind of a feature that the males use to attract a female. Um, so that is just worth noting that sometimes males will have features that females don't, but it's like, it doesn't mean you have to rule them out, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, yeah, there we go. Well done. So now we'll focus on female ducks a little bit more. Uh, so I'll put four up and we can just have a look at how they're different. There we go. Um, so this just kind of focuses on those features a little bit more. Um, so for example, the pintail, I keep talking about them because they're one of my favorite ducks, um, but they're really elegant. They've got smooth curves. Um, the shoveler has this big shovel built beak uh, which even if it's got its head down feeding, if you watch it, eventually it will lift it up as it needs to swallow. So um, yeah, they that's quite a distinct feature. Widgeon have this small bill and that big rounded head is quite noticeable. Um, they're also a bit more of a, like a rusty color of brown compared to a lot of other female ducks. Um, so, and on the right there, you've got the male widgeon um, and the same with the teal on the right is the male, left is the female. It's hard to gauge it from this, but a teal is really small. They're probably maybe a third the size of a mat. Well, two thirds the size of a mat, half the size there. They're very, very small ducks. So if you see them compared to other ducks, quite often you'll be like, whoa, who is this? You're so small. Um, and that's quite a good feature. But also, um, as we'll go on to, uh, that green on the wing is a really distinctive thing with teal. So it's called a speculum and tealy green, green teal, um, yeah. So another thing is um, like some of them are particularly similar. So a classic example is the gadbor and the mallard. So gadbor on the left, mallard on the right. 
Um, and even with these, don't be put off because there are ways to identify them. Um, so in these two, if we look, the gadwall, the females quite often have um, this like a lot more orange on the bill, they kind of look like they're wearing orange lipstick. Whereas mylads, sometimes they do have a little bit of orange, but it's not not to the same extent. Um, Gab will also have a much rounder head as well um, than the mallard. Um, and yeah, there, there is another feature as well. So as I've mentioned, the speculum. So as well as in teal, you can also use it to separate um, gadwall and mallards. So these are images of males, but it's the same on the females. So I've highlighted that with the circle. So it's this, it's the secondary feathers. It's the bit on their wing with the color. Um, so in gadwall, if you think gadwall's got a W in it, so gadwall has a white speculum, green teal has the green speculum, and then mallard, M for marine. I was kind of reaching a bit with that one, but there we go. Um, marine blue is theirs. Um, and it also often, it's not just in flight or when they're flapping, but when their wings are folded um, and they're just sat there, quite often you'll get a bit of a, a bit of a view of it. So it's it's worth paying attention to. Um, the mallard does have kind of white edging to it. So just be wary of that because sometimes you can only see the white and you have to kind of look to see if there is the blue or if it's completely white and if it's capital. Um, but yeah, this is really, really useful feature that I find. So another challenge, uh, let's practice and uh, have a look at this image and see how many species you think you can see. So again, if you pause it and then come back for the answer. Okay, so on this one, there's three species. So the one at the back, we haven't even talked about yet, but it's quite obviously different. So the back right is a shell duck. Um, and then there's two other species. So the, the potchard, which we've mentioned with the really long migration, um, is the one with the red head and the gray back. There is also a female potchard there. So he's got a similar, quite hard to see from the angle, but similar head shape. It's not as round as, as the others. So the, the far left bird is a female potchard. And then the other three uh, kind of in the middle are all tufted ducks. So um, yeah, the, the males have the tuft on the head and the females, they don't have the tuft, but they've still got that similar shape, similar like, bill shape and head shape. Okay. Uh, so here's another challenge. Have a go with this one. Okay, uh, so on this one, I don't know if I put the answer on there. No, I haven't. So I think I can see three species, I think. <laughs> um, so we start with uh, the one that's quite obviously different, the, the shoveler with that green head um, and that big shovel bill. So there's quite a few of them about the males have the green head and the brown patch on them. Um, I don't think I can see any females in there. Um, oh yeah, no, there's one right in the middle at the front. Uh, and then we've got the widgeon, which are the ones, the males have that red head with the with the kind of yellow bit at the front and then uh, the females are brown, but they, that round head is a really distinctive feature. Um, and then the, the smaller ducks with the kind of reddish and then the green on their head. Um, also a yellow bum, which is distinctive on the males. Uh, but yeah, mainly if with the females, you're looking for the size, uh, teal are in there as well. Okay, another challenge. So how many species? So hopefully for that one, you got three again. <laughs> um, so uh, let's start with the pintail because they're my favorite. Um, in the middle at the back, uh, we've got a male and a female pintail, and then again on the right, we've got another male pintail. Um, at the bottom right, 
there's a shoveler now that bill if you just compare it if you compare that bill to the pintail in the middle just it's like kind of half again as long it's really really distinctive and then the rest of them are widgeon with that lovely round head and the short bill um, another reason why ducks could be difficult to ID is that males are sneaky and they do this thing called eclipse plumage or they go into eclipse plumage so eclipse plumage is essentially um, after they've mated so kind of in the summer um, they need to change their feathers and because they live on water the quickest way to do that is to just lose all of their flight feathers at once so they can just grow them back all at once and then they can be flying again because it's quite dangerous when you can't fly but also if you're molting it like a lot of other birds do um, for example passerines perching birds like say your classic blue tit they'll molt their feathers their flight feathers um, kind of sequentially they'll do it in order so they'll kind of have some feathers lost at time sometimes you see buzzards flying over and or birds of prey and they'll have some feathers missing if it's symmetrical it's molt so essentially when these birds do this they can't fly and you've seen how obvious the males look the reason they look that obvious most of the time is that they want to attract a mate now that's great but when you can't fly what you need to do is become camouflaged uh, because otherwise things will eat you and you don't want that so it can look like there's no males. Quite often they resemble or they're very, very similar to females. Um, but yeah, essentially they're hiding in plain sight. They are there. Uh, so this molt where they can't fly is called a catastrophic molt. Um, and then they molt to be well camouflaged. Um, so how do you tell the difference between them? So it's quite similar to the females. You can still use the structure that shovel, that shovel is still going to have a shovel bill. That mallard's still going to be a classic duck pond shape. Um, yeah, it's it's still a really useful feature, and this is why we just highlight it so much because it's it's just one that even if the lighting's bad, it's so useful to use. Um, and uh, in the case of the bottom bird, uh, the mallard, uh, so I've now added a picture of a female mallard, and you might be thinking how do you tell the difference between the male and the females when they're in this stage well a big clue is firstly the actual color um it's a bit more kind of i feel like it looks a bit more a bit scruffier in the females in a way like their, their feathers are a lot more patterned if you look there's a lot more like dark specks whereas in the male the, the color just seems a lot smoother um but also if you look at that bill that's the main thing the male will still have that yellow bill, whereas the female has that dark, slightly, slightly orange bill. Um, so that's the giveaway. So male, female. So here's another challenge. Uh, so we've spoken about Eclipse now. Now this is a bird that we have seen so far. But we haven't seen it in Eclipse. Um, so I'd like you to tell me what species it is and then how many males and females you can see. Okay, so in this image we have eider ducks. So eider ducks, they have that kind of distinctive Roman nose um, that they're kind of, yeah, they're, they're really, really sleek birds. Um, they're also massive, which you can't see on here, but they're really, really chunky. Um, and we have, my mouse wants to work, three males and three females. So the females are highlighted in yellow uh, and then the males I haven't highlighted. Um, so the females have that kind of, they're more brown, they're more um, kind of speckledy. Uh, whereas the males, when they go into eclipse, rather than turn brown, for some reason, they just go blotchy black. And I'm, I'm not sure why. Um, but yeah, I did ducks. So as well as what the birds look like, you can also use what they're doing. Uh, and one of these things are feeding behaviour. So what were the two main types of feeding behaviour that we spoke about right at the start? So hopefully you remembered that those were divers and dabblers. 
And can anyone think of another? I did mention it with one of the birds in the dabbler group. Okay, so they are diving, dabbling, and then the other one is grazing. Now, these are the widgeon. I like to think of them as tiny feathery cows because you just see little herds of them over the, over the grassy fields in the winter. Um, they're a lot cuter than cows. They sound cuter than cows. Um, yeah, grazing. Uh, another thing we can use is habitat. Um, and these are, as well as kind of inland, um, kind of freshwater wetlands, you can also find them co in coastal areas. So, for example, rocky shores, you'll often find uh, eiders. I think they like to feed on mussels. So you'll see them diving around the coast there. Um, mud flats, estuaries, so shell ducks really like eating mollusks. Um, so they'll kind of wade through the mud and they'll put the bill through. Um, so mud flats are really good for a lot of uh, a lot of birds, and out at sea as well. We do also get sea ducks. Um, so for example, common scoter, velvet scoter, um, smeary, those are sea ducks. Um, so yeah, sometimes you just look out at sea and you're like, what is that duck doing there? Um, yeah, they're a wide variety. Season and range is another really useful um, a, a useful feature. And this is the case for, I guess, like habitat and feeding all of those. It's the case for other birds as well. Um, so an example here, we've got greater scorp and tufted duck. Now these are those athia ducks, those athia diving ducks uh, that we were talking about earlier. And they do look quite similar. Um, there are some differences in the structure, very subtle. But if you're seeing it at the back of a pond and it keeps diving and you can't quite get a good look at it, uh, particularly if it's like a female or a young bird and it's not got that kind of shiny silver back, if it's a scorp, how would you go about working out? Now, there is a really easy way in some cases. So let's talk about the season and range. So I put the key here for the maps. Now, these are from my bird guide. Uh, so most bird guides will have these little maps of distribution. So the colour marks where they are, but what colour it is marks when they're there as well, which is really useful to pay attention to. So say we're at a lake in the summer in the Midlands, so in the middle of the country, in summer, which is it more likely to be? So in this case, it's much more likely to be a tufted duck because tufted duck, they're, they've got a wide distribution. They're in a lot of places all year round from the green. Whereas the greater scorp, they only tend to really be coastal and only tend to be here in the winter. So this just gives an idea. It's, I mean, these, like, it's worth paying attention to um, like birds sometimes birds do turn up in funny places uh, also sometimes birds maybe stay hang around for whatever reason maybe they're not very well they can migrate um, also pay attention to how old your bird guide is because sometimes they can be slightly out of date um, but generally they're really really useful tools to use um, and it can give you an idea of if what you're looking at is actually likely to be that so it's most likely to be a duck, a duck in this case So, as I've said, greater scorp is a rare winter visitor, so it's probably a tufted duck. Sounds are also really useful, as is the case for most birds. Um, you wouldn't have thought it, because obviously we're used to thinking of like the songs that birds make, but actually they make some absolutely quacking calls. Um, I'm really sorry for that pun. <laughs> so, here's two of my favourite duck sounds. Uh, hopefully you can hear this. So if you can hear that, this is an eider duck. And I think they sound like someone who's just heard some really juicy gossip. They're just like, oh. Um, yeah, a <laughs> very, very good sound. Uh, and this other one is a widgeon. When you listen to it, that high pitched squeak. 
may sound a little bit like a squeaky toy. Um, so yeah, as you can see, they do display a lot of very different sounds. Um, it's also worth just being aware of hybrids and escapees, which is, I think, uh, ducks are probably the biggest group where this happens in. Um, ducks seem to mate with kind of anything, so you do get a lot of hybrids. Uh, so um, you also get escapees, so like more domestic ducks. So, for example, this, the duck on the left is actually one of my favourite individual ducks. Um, I call him Little Pete. He's at Slimbridge. Uh, the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust place and he is a cool duck which is like a little domestic duck that makes a lot of noise and um, historically people would use them to attract other ducks in uh, like wildfowlers would use them um, it's kind of a dark story actually but little Pete doesn't do that now he just sits on his duck pond and eats food and has a great life um, you also have things like muscovy ducks like farm ducks um, and then you've just got escapees from collections that just appear in places. So, for example, uh, on the top right, um, bar-headed geese are actually the highest flying birds in the world. They migrate. They're, they're from Asia and they migrate over the Himalayas, which is like obviously very, very high and an amazing feat. Um, and yet, if you go to a field in Gloucestershire, you will probably see one. <laughs> because there is like a feral population around, uh, which have most likely escaped from people's collections. Similarly, the hooded Maganza at the bottom right, uh, now they're from North America. Some of them are over here. And then you get hybrids, like this really stonking individual at the bottom in the middle. Uh, now, I, th I think this is probably a mallard with a pintail. Um, so as I said, ducks will mate with other species for some reason. Um, so you do get some strange things. So just be aware of that. Uh, now we're going to go on to talking about uh, why the UK is so good for wildfowl and uh, general water birds in the winter. So if we think about why the birds actually come here in the winter, it's all about location. So if you think about um, kind of how far north we are. Um, we're we're in level with like Canada, and um, if you think about it, it's if you go to a similar sort of latitude in Canada, it's very very cold, and you might come face to face with a polar bear. However, here it's very warm. Um, and why is that? Why is it so warm when we're so far north? Well, the reason is the Gulf Stream. So, because of kind of ocean currents kind of influencing the way that the airflow goes we get really warm air coming from um, the Caribbean, coming across the Atlantic Ocean. And that is why we are so much warmer than um, like North America at the same, like, at the same latitude. Um, and that means that birds don't have to fly as far. When they're migrating south in the winter, they don't have to fly as far south if they stop here because it is so warm. So it makes sense to go somewhere where you don't have to go as far to get what you want. Um, so speaking about migration, um, I will say, because we haven't actually covered this yet, if you haven't seen the last season or what this season is from, migration is when birds um, kind of annually like migrate to a place. So most commonly it's between breeding grounds and non-breeding grounds, like wintering grounds. Um, and the reason they do that is because uh, maybe the weather's not favourable. So a lot of birds, for example, the Buick swan in this case, they breed in the Arctic tundra. But then come the winter, that just freezes over. They can't feed. They need they need like grain and um, they graze as well. But if they can't get to the food, then they need to move south. Also, it's so cold. You don't really want to be there. And the days are really, really short. So they move down to these fav more favourable conditions. So in the case of the Buick swan, as I've said, breed in the tundra in Arctic Russia, around 4,350 winter in the UK, and they fly around 3,500 kilometers to their wintering ground, which is it's a long way. Um, so as you can see on a map, this is roughly how far. 
Uh, and in a few weeks, we will also be releasing the recorded session from last season about migration. So if you want to learn more about this, if you didn't catch it last time, or if you just want a recap, uh, then yeah, check, keep an eye on the YouTube um, and hopefully that will come out soon. So I've said how many birds, how many Buick swans there are in the country. How do we actually know that? So a big thing with the BTO is we count birds. We monitor them. That is kind of that's our jam, that's our purpose. And in terms of wetland birds, as the name suggests, the main one that we do is the wetland bird survey. So that you'll, you'll hear people talking about webs. So if you hear someone talking about their website, it could mean one of two things. It could mean obviously a website or it could mean where they go to count their birds. We like to think the latter. Um, so the wetland bird survey uh, has been ongoing since 1947. Uh, it's been a partnership with the BTO, the RSPB and JNCC, so Joint, Joint Nature Conservation Conservancy or something. Um, and it was previously uh, run with the WWT as well, so the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. Um, there are monthly counts conducted by volunteers and there's core count days usually in the middle of the month. So the aim is for most people to go out on the same day, just so you can kind of, you're not double counting so much. And the aim is to assess the population size of non-breeding water birds. So the core time is the winter. So um, that's when the birds have come here. They're not in their breeding grounds. Um, however, they do do it year round. Um, it also assesses the trends in the numbers and distribution of these populations and the importance of individual sites for water birds. So um, some birds, like certain sites are really important for some birds. And if it goes on that, say a site is being threatened with development, understanding how birds use these areas is really important to be able to inform policy and inform um, developers and things like that. So if we go back to our Buicks, uh, looking at the kind of, this is the, across a year, the average kind of number that we've collated from Web's data. So the monthly trend shows a peak in winter months, so peaking in kind of December to January, which is actually as I'm recording this, which is brilliant. Um, however, if we look at the annual trend, so this is the trend going from kind of before the 70s, there's been, they did increase, but there's been a massive decrease um, and this, we're like five, over five years on from this, um, there's been a massive decrease in the past 30 years. So why is this? So by, by doing the survey and identifying that there is a, a decrease, this highlighted that this was happening and has meant that scientists have been able to investigate this and try and find out what's happening. Um, so it's thought mainly that um, a big thing is climate change. So birds, as I said, birds don't need to come as far south. So that, that's why they come to the UK. But actually, because of climate change, areas on the continent, so also further east, they're similarly warm and there's food there. And but it basically, they don't now need to come as far because of climate change. They don't have to come as far on their migration because it's a lot warmer further up. Um, so that means that we're getting short stopping. Um, they're also threatened by a number of things. So uh, habitat loss. Um, so as these birds are short stopping, they're staying in other areas. We've got a lot of protection in the UK because they've been coming here historically. We've put that protection in place. If they're now wintering in new areas, you don't know if or it, it might be the case that there's not protection in place where they are. Um, also, um, another big issue is lead poisoning from um, like lead shot, which is a, it's commonly used in wildfowl, like wildfowling. Um, I think the EU did recently ban it, which is really good. Um, but there is still a lot out in the environment that's just that's been left since it's been shot and they pick it up thinking it's grit. So quite often it's not necessarily birds like birds do get shot but it's not just those it's birds that are um 
they're picking up grit because they need it in inside them to help kind of break down they don't have teeth so they need this grit to help break down the food that they're eating so they're picking up these bits of grit that they think is grit but it's actually lead shot um so the the tragedy is that that is poisoning them um so yeah there, there are a number of threats and um hopefully now that we know what they are we can address them um but the main the main thing is that we knew that this was happening because of webs, which meant that we could then find out why and hopefully we can then help them. So that actually wraps up our session. Um, now I'm going to talk about the challenges that we did for last season. Um, if you want to do them, just, just as an idea, if you want some things to kind of get you inspired to get involved with water birds. So the first challenge is getting nosy with swans. So today I've spoken about two species of swans that we get in the UK. So the mute swan is our resident swan. Buick swan is one of the winter visitors that we get. Now, can you find out what other swan visits the UK in winter? And can you tell me how you tell them apart from the other two species? Now the clues in the name, getting nosy. I won't say any more than that, but good luck. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the second challenge is the wetland detective so if you visit your local wetland lake or pond and see how many wildflower species you can see based on the structure so you don't necessarily need to know what they are it would be great if you could if you can remember things like remember what we talked about today but there's no pressure we just want to get you thinking about what we've discussed and um, just trying to like work out which birds are different when you've kind of seen how many you can see, just watch one species for five minutes and see what it does. Is it diving? Is it dabbling? Is it in the middle of the pond? Is it sticking to the edges? How is it behaving? Um, and a bonus challenge is then watch another species and see if it's behaving differently. And then finally, if you do do the second challenge, have a look around and see what other species what other water birds you can see. Can you see any geese species? And if so, how many? Um, and can you see any species of grebe? So we I vaguely touched upon them right at the start when introducing them, but if you've got your bird guide, if you have a look in there, or you can look for online resources as well to help you know uh, what types we get there. Um, but yeah, can you spot any of those? So here we've got a, uh, a Brent goose at, at the top, a coot in the middle and then this is a great crested grebe now this is in its breeding plumage so in the winter they don't quite have they don't quite look so smart on the top um, but the general shape is quite similar um, so yeah keep an eye out for any of these and more uh, and I would just want to remind you about the equipment donation scheme the EDS that BTO youth run uh, now this is a really really cool um, scheme where essentially people donate their old uh, books or optics like binocular scopes and then we redistribute it to young people that need equipment um, for example if you can't afford equipment or you're not sure what to get it's a really really good way um, to get pre-loved kit um, and it's also good for the environment as well because it's recycling but if you're interested then check out the equipment donation scheme on the BTO's website because um, yeah we'd love to help as many people as possible uh, it'd be also great if you could follow the BTO on social media, find out what we've been up to. Um, so that's at, B, at underscore BTO on Twitter, British Trust for Ornithology on Facebook and at BTO Birds on Instagram. Um, and if you'd like to contact us, then uh, our kind of youth rep um, information is www.bto.org forward slash youth reps. Or you can email us at the um, youth at bto.org email address um, and yeah we've got some really cool events coming up so definitely keep an eye out on there um, and the last thing to say is thank you very much for listening and yeah we really hope you enjoyed this session and enjoy all the others that are coming out on YouTube and yeah keep an eye out and come along to our season two sessions uh, we love making them and we really hope you love uh, watching them so yeah thank you very much <laughs>